All right, y'all. It is that time again for another episode of ColumbusBlack.com Support Black Business Series. We're coming to you all live today with a special and very, very relevant topic for our business owners, and it is PPP facts, right? We want to talk about the facts that you need to know in regards to the second round. And I have some special guests here with me today um, that I'm going to introduce momentarily. But before we get started, for those that have not been with us before, I want to make sure you know who we are. So I'm Kevin Lloyd. I'm the founder and CEO of ColumbusBlack.com, uh, which is an online platform connecting the Black community to commerce and culture. And how do we do that? We do that through our omni-channel platform, right? So whether it's through our website, through our email blasts, our text blasts, our social media presence, and pre-COVID and eventually post-COVID, our event activations as well to get you connected to the community. We focus on commerce and culture. The commerce side is what we're talking about today, which is business, right? So we want to connect business owners to those that want to patronize them and those that want to patronize them to the businesses, right? So and then on the culture side, we focus on entertainment and activities to make sure that everybody knows all the great things that's happening right here in the capital city. So we've been around for 15 years and we're excited for the opportunity to bring very relevant topics like this one tonight. And our show tonight is also sponsored by the Ohio Small Business Development Centers at Columbus State Community College. So we're excited to have them as a sponsor and excited to have them on the show with us tonight to talk about something so important to the future of each one of our businesses. So with that being said, we're gonna shift gears away from me and what we are here doing today at Columbus Black to get into the topic of discussion. PPP facts, which you need to know about the second round, right? So with that being said, I want to introduce our first guest, Tanya Wilson, uh, who's a business advisor with the Ohio Small Business Development Center at Columbus State Community College. So Tanya, I'm gonna let you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Well, as you said, I'm Tanya Wilson. I'm, I'm uh, a certified business advisor with the Ohio Small Business Development Center. I've been uh, with the center since uh, about 2007. And, uh, and so I advise uh, business owners. Um, uh, I, like all the other advisors in our, in our center, are generalists. You know, so we work with all different industries from, you know, I just I have an idea and I don't know what to do with it all the way to, you know, I've been in business for 20 years and I need to find an, I need a succession plan. I need to change markets. You know, I need, I need funding, which is where a lot of people come to us, um, et cetera. Um, in addition to that, I, uh, I specialize in marketing, so I have a heavy marketing background, and so um, I primarily am the only one in the office who does the digital marketing. We have another advisor who also um, does, um, does marketing, but uh, I do all the digital marketing um, advising, and I also do marketing and, and branding for the center itself. Outstanding, outstanding. So, so appropriate for Tanya to be on the show tonight, especially with what we do at ColumbusBlack.com from a marketing standpoint. So thank you for joining us and taking the time to share some of your knowledge and expertise as well. Okay. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. And then we'll move over to Ellen Harvey, who's uh, also a certified business advisor. Um, and then she's with Kiva as a capital access manager. So would you mind introducing yourself as well, Ellen, and tell us a little bit about what it is that you do and your relationship with SBDC? Yes, Kevin, thank you very much. Yes, my name is Ellen Harvey. I am also a certified business advisor and provide one-on-one -on -one counseling and um, also the manager of the Kiva crowdfunding platform, a microloan that we offer through the Small Business Development Center. Um, with the uh, SBDC, I provide counseling and I provide training on regards to loan packaging, as well as introductions into the Kiva program and assist with that. Um, been with uh, the SBDC since April of 2018, been in economic development for over 10 years, worked with several other agencies. And so I am uh, here to assist small businesses with all things lending. Awesome, awesome, all things lending, right? And this is, uh, I think this is the perfect time for us to have you on the show. So, so Tanya, we're gonna come back to you for a second. So in regards to SBDC, I know you, you mentioned a, a number of things that you can help with. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit more, especially based on what you guys have seen in 2019, excuse me, in 2020 and now going into 2021 as it relates to business offerings and how you all can help? I want to make sure people know, like, this is when I reach out to SBDC and this is the help that they should be able to provide, as well as what should I, where should I be, like, from a business perspective that might be a perfect fit for your services? Okay. Um, well, so the SBDC, um, we are a national organization. So there's about 27 our, 
I think about 27 centers like ourselves in Ohio, there's about a thousand across the US, right? And so uh, where most people find us and come to us is when they are starting a business. You know, they, people who are uh, interested in starting a business will generally seek out um, resources. And so, um, and so they'll usually do a Google search and find us organically like that. And so for those individuals, you know, we have a, um, a startup series that we put them through where, you know, it tells them everything you need to know about how to start a business. We also help them vet their business idea to make sure that, uh, you know, it's a viable idea. There's actually a market for that idea. Um, you know, there's, um, and uh, make sure that they are targeting the market correctly. And, uh, and also, of course, look at, you know, uh, financials and, and items like that. Uh, and we also have a tax class. So, so there's a whole series that we put through and we have everyone go through that who's starting a business to get like the fine, the foundational um, information that they need before they meet one on one with advisor. Okay. Um, when people work with us uh, in that capacity, they are working with us. Um, we get them, uh, we do a lot of trainings uh, for individuals, uh, for small businesses. And what we do, we do that training so it augments our one on one training, our one on one advising. Our primary work is to sit down with every in, uh, small business owner one on one and work with them and uh, wherever they are in their business with whatever need that they have. Um, and so we, um, that's why we do the, the, get the foundation information going for the um, startups. Um, so what most people don't have a tendency to come to, especially existing business owners mm -hmm. is, uh, to realize that we're still here for them. You know, we're not just startups. And yeah. so we work with individuals again, all the way until you no longer, uh, qual qualify as a small business, which is very large. You know, most small businesses have to exceed 500 employees to okay. no longer be considered a small business. So we go by the SBA definition. Um, and then there's lots of other industries that are more specialized that can actually go up to 1500 employees and we can still work with them. And so at that point, uh, a business owner will come to us and uh, when you're, when they're an existing business owner, they, you know, they come in, they get a, they go directly to a one-on-one -on -one meeting and we meet them wherever they are. And so uh, typically in this past year, as you were saying, lots of issues that are coming in and concerns and people need assistance with, of course, capital. You know, yeah. they've lost a lot of, um, you know, businesses have been shut down because of COVID, you know, uh, people are staying home. And so they're having to find um, a lot of another way to reach people if they are allowed to be open. Yeah. And, uh, and in that situation, that's when marketing comes into play. So uh, marketing and capital has been uh, the biggest needs in this past year. Yeah, marketing and capital. All right. Well, we're going to be talking about both of those today. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and shift in to the topic of discussion, right? So PPP, the Payroll Protection Plan. And uh, before we get started there, I wanna make sure for our guest tonight, if you have a question, you can drop it in the chat, okay? Also, if you know a business owner, please tag them, right? So right now, any business owners you know, they should be listening into this call, whether they decide to leverage this as an option or not. You don't wanna take, uh, take uh, take the opportunity or miss the opportunity, should I say, when we have experts on the line like we do tonight. So with that being said, payroll protection plan, can you all explain to us in this most simplest form, what is what does that really mean for the, the, the everyday business owner and what do we need to know about it? So the Paycheck uh, Protection Program was actually created to make sure that the workforce uh, could stay employed. And so funding was provided for businesses that are already in existence um, that have been operational since uh, 2019, since February of 2019. <clears throat> and what it does is provide for two and a half times of the average monthly payroll expenses to cover costs like, uh, of course, payroll, right? Health benefits, um, limited non-health contributions, mortgage interest, uh, rent payments, utilities, things like that. Um, it portion of it, when it initially was rolled out, uh, was forgivable and that percentage has changed over time. Um, now, as long as 60% of the funds is going towards um, payroll cost, um, the funds can be, the payroll protection program loan can actually be forgiven. 
And so it has changed over time and has morphed quite a bit. And so now we're seeing the rollout of the expanded version of the Paycheck Protection Program, which now includes phase two, where businesses are able to reapply if they've already received uh, one Paycheck Protection uh, loan and uh, a reopening of the program to allow those individuals that have not been able, or businesses that have not been able to participate in it, an opportunity to do so. Okay, okay, okay. So thank you, Ellen, for explaining explaining that uh, to us and breaking that down. So how does this, how does it work, right? Like, so I know that there's been a lot of questions in regards to who really qualifies for it and how do you go about even, and obviously a lot of information is online, but how do you go about the process um, I know that there's supposed to be a form online. How does that whole process work uh, for individual business owners? Yes, great question. So the program is not a direct loan through the SBA, like the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. It is a loan that you do have to apply with your local banking partner. Um, the best uh, option is to go to the bank of which you already have a business relationship. Um, if that bank or credit union or uh, local CDFI um, is not able to provide you funding, uh, there is a tool that is on the SBA's website that is called Lender Match, of which you can put in your information and find a lender um, that is offering the programming for the PPP. Um, once uh, going to uh, the bank, you are going to be given an application um, it's a five page application that the business owner is going to need to complete. Um, and if the funding being requested is under 250,000, the required document is not asked for until later. Um, at that point in time, uh, with the application, the banking officer can assist uh, the business entity in completing that. They can come to us for assistance with that resource and the Columbus Urban League through their program is also offering um, assistance uh, with the application and with advocacy work uh, for minority businesses as well. Um, the application is, uh, is pretty involved. There are a couple of things that, um, that, are, that I wanna highlight in that application that businesses do need to be ready um, to have available to be able to complete it. And one of those is the NICS codes. The application um, refers to this code, which helps define for the SBA, the industry in which the business operates. So that is something that is um, needed on the application that a lot of businesses do not have that information that they would need to go and locate their NICS codes. And that's a, uh, N-A-I-C-S. Um, in addition to that, uh, they also need to make sure that they have their identification number. So the employer identification number, their tax identification number. And they can find that on their Schedule C of their tax return or on their uh, 1120s if they're a S corp or corporation. An average amount of their monthly payroll um, there's calculations, uh, formulas that are, is on the SBA website that they can use in helping them to calculate that um, in a certain time frame of which they, are, they can look at to, to assess that. The easiest way really truly is, is looking at the annual and then uh, dividing that out by 12. But there are some businesses that are seasonal that won't be able to look at that or maybe fluctuating. They can, some, uh, they can look at quarterly. Uh, uh, figures for that as well. And with the new rollout of um, the phase one uh, applications, um, if, again, these are for businesses that have not applied for it yet, um, they can look at quarters as well for qualifying for that. But there are, like I said, there are forms um, that can be used that the bank can provide in helping them to calculate that as well as uh, links on the SBA website that takes you to uh, access to um, uh, formulas that you can use um, to calculate that monthly um, payroll cost, but you need to have those records available to be um, to be reviewed. And then uh, at least 20, if any owner um, has uh, interest exceeding 20%, um, they also need to be a part of the application um, and you need to have their information um, as well. Uh, 
there's some things that is good to note about this process. And uh, that is that the, um, again, the business has to have been in operations before February 15th, 2020. Um, and uh, in addition to that, there need to be ongoing operations. So we can have a business that unfortunately has been had to close their doors and is now seeking funding to take care of some expenses that they had prior. Um, this funding is not for that. Again, it is for uh, the maintaining of operations and um, maintaining of uh, employment for uh, W-2 employees and of course um, yourself if you are just a sole proprietor or one owner. Um, can you can you do me a favor not to throw you off, but I know that there tends to be a lot of questions around the requirement of uh, W-2 versus 1099 and whether or not people can qualify or not qualify. Can you clarify that for those who are wondering about that? Because I think, you know, especially with uh, some black owned businesses, right? We're talking solopreneurs may not be, you know, doing a, a W-2. Um, they may be contracting, they may be a 1099. How does that work for those individuals in this situation? Do they qualify, not qualify, things like that? Yeah, so um, the funding is available for um, sole proprietors, one owners that are not W-2ing their sales. Um, if in fact uh, you have a business that says, I have employees, but those employees that they consider our employees are 1099, um, uh, those employees does not make them eligible, but themselves does, right? So if it is a sole proprietor, one owner, you are in fact considered an employee, you qualify for the program. If you have 1099 contract workers, those 1099 contract workers actually qualify for the program themselves. Um, so it is for the one a person owner of a sole proprietor. It is for uh, a one person, 100% owner of a, um, a limited liability company. Um, and it is for those individuals that are 1099 contract workers uh, 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 that have filed a Schedule C um, also can take advantage of the program as well as nonprofits um, that are 501Cs and threes and um, also um, churches. Thank you. That is very, very insightful because I know that there's a lot of uh, questions and confusion around that in particular. So thank you for explaining that. Um, I know I interrupted you uh, to ask you about that because uh, it was a nice segue, but you were getting ready to share something else uh, prior to that. Well, I mean, there's there's a, a lot of information to be shared about it. Um, and feel free to, to jump in there, please, and ask me the questions because um, it is so much. Um, We'll say that some of the um, eligibility for the expenses of the expenses that could be included as far as uh, could be paid by the PPP has been expanded. Um, so early on when the program was launched, um, it could only cover payroll expenses, uh, the health benefits, the mortgage rent, uh, I'm sorry, the mortgage interest, the rent and utilities. Now that has been expanded to cover um, other operations like software, uh, human resource needs, um, property damage, which was interesting because a lot of the insurance was not covering uh, damage to properties because it was around the COVID, around the pandemic. So it is uh, allowing for that now as well. Um, it's during a certain period of time, but it is allowing for that. Um, it's covering uh, uh, supplier cost now as well. And then also uh, worker protection expenditures, so mask and so forth. So those were some great changes that was made to the program that opened it up a bit. Uh, for the use of funds, because that was one of the things that a lot of small businesses found challenging um, uh, when they first applied for it. Another one was that they expanded the time frame of when you could use the funds. Initially, it was only uh, eight weeks. That has actually been expanded to uh, 24 weeks now uh, that the funds received can be used and be considered for um, forgiveness. So that was a nice change as well. Um, and then it opened it up to some other types of businesses um, as well too. So security companies and um, uh, some other larger organizations that are food-based production companies um, that exceed the uh, small business uh, um, size as far as number of employees and as well as uh, gross receipts. So they've made some, some good changes to it. They also um, uh, initially when the program rolled out 
the um, economic injury disaster loan advance. So that uh, $1,000 to $10,000 a lot of small businesses was getting, um, it was deducted from the forgivable part of the PPP. So again, the Paycheck Protection Program. That is no longer happening. Okay. So what is going on now is that that is not a part of the calculations for the forgiveness part of the PPP. Um, in fact, businesses are allowed to um, that not even be considered. So that is, that is great. So um, so where in some cases the PPP was forgiven at ten thousand dollars minus the three thousand dollar, for example, advance. That no longer is the case. They will get the full uh, ten thousand uh, dollar forgiveness for the pay, uh, paycheck protection program. So that that was a good thing as well too. So do me a favor, right? Because mm -hmm. first of all, you just dropped a lot of knowledge, right? And this, this happens normally when I have business owners on and they give us the story or they tell us about the business and it's just like, hold on, hold on, hold on. There's a lot, there's a lot that happened to get you to this point, right? So in this case, you mentioned forgiveness. Um, you mentioned, I think it was the EDIL, right? Um, and how that all worked or didn't work. Can you circle back? So when people hear forgiveness, what does that really mean? And then as far as the, the other loan and now that being forgiven versus not before, can you go back to that just so that everybody really understands that part as well? Yeah, so the Paycheck uh, Protection Program had a caveat to it. And that was that if you use the funds based on the percentages that was outlined in the program, and at this point in time, that's 60% of uh, the funding that you received, specifically to pay for maintaining the operations and payroll for your business that you then could apply with your banking institution for forgiveness of the money that you uh, received. And it wasn't just for the 60% that you paid uh, out of uh, uh, the loan funds, but it was for all of the money that you received. So for an example, $10,000 and you took 6,000 of that and paid towards operating expenses and payroll of the business, you then could uh, uh, apply with your bank form 3502, I believe it was, um, to uh, have those um, funds that you received waived. And you would provide documentation that during the period of time, eight weeks or over 24 weeks at this point in time with the adjustments made to the program, that you paid these expenses. And if so, then that whole $10,000 was forgiven. And there was nothing that was to be repaid back um, on uh, that uh, loan. Now, if in fact you did not use the funds and you didn't have to, um, but to take advantage of the forgiveness, you did. But if you did not ha uh, take 60% uh, of those funds and put it towards the eligible cost for the program, then your loan actually became a loan. And if you uh, received funding before, um, I believe it was- June 5th, 2020, I think. I'm sorry. June 5th of 2020. Yes, that's correct. If you received funding before June 5th of 2020, then uh, the balance became a loan that was repaid over a two year period of time at a 1% interest rate. If uh, it was after that um, and with the new guidelines, that's now been ex extended that that loan would be repayable over a five-year period of time at 1%. But again, to reiterate, if in fact you use the funds as they were supposed to be used as intended based on the eligibility requirements at 60% usage, then you would be able to waive the entire loan completely. Nice. Thank you for explaining and breaking that down. So hopefully everybody actually got that. If you didn't, the cool part is this is recorded. So you can actually hit the rewind button and go back and play it again uh, because that was very, very well explained. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Ellen, you dropped a lot of knowledge. Tanya, was there anything that you wanted to chime in on from what she has shared thus far, um, even if it relates to helping businesses to go through this process the first time and maybe even the second time so far, anything that you wanna add on to what she shared thus far? Um, not really, I mean, Ellen, uh, Ellen is definitely our go-to in the office uh, when it comes to any, anything financing, we're always like, Ellen, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we also have a lot of this information on our website. And so on our website at sbdccolumbus.com, 
um, we have a page on there so called COVID-19 Recovery. And so you can just link to it at the top. And uh, it will provide uh, some of these bullet points that Ellen was talking about, but then it'll actually uh, link back to the SBA web, uh, website where you can get that. We can also get the form that Ellen um, talked about, um, the forgiveness form. And so you'll be able to find a lot of information there. Um, some of the things I know, like uh, with some of our small business owners and um, Ellen, I don't wanna throw a question to you, but uh, in terms of, uh, you know, with some of the business owners, like, un unfortunately, especially starting out, you know, their, um, the bookkeeping isn't always great, right? Yep. And so, uh, and so I think that becomes some of the challenge with the PPP when our clients are trying to, um, you know, show that they can qualify for it, which this has made it easier, um, this second round, um, you know, talking about the sole proprietorship, but being, uh, being able to be clear to show how they've been um, tracking payroll. And then also when they, when it comes time for, uh, for, uh, forgiveness, you know, they have to be able to show that they actually um, use that, th use those funds, funds appropriately to get the, um, to get that funding. Um, Ellen, did you uh, have anything, any, um, are there any specific ways that they would do that? I know we have, we have had a uh, form on our website, I believe it, um, there's a document checklist. And so I think some of that, um, you know, could be still corrected in terms of how that they could actually, um, what does a small business owner do, you know, when, they um, maybe not have had the best, uh, you know, payroll tracking. Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, guidelines for uh, the documentation required underneath uh, 250,000 is less than if uh, the funding is beyond 250,000. Mm -hmm. Regardless, uh, for this program, they are going to have to provide the appropriate documentation so that um, the, the monthly uh, amount for the payroll can be calculated so that the percentage of the loan amount or the loan amount can be determined. Now, it does fall back on the uh, business owner to provide that documentation. It falls back on that business owner to do the calculation, and they are signing off on the application that they have uh, provided information that is true and correct and and really the SBA is putting them on the line. It's not the lender that's held responsible. It's not an advisor that's held responsible. It is them. And so um, for a, a, a sole proprietor or a limited liability company um, with one owner, uh, a Schedule C uh, tax return is, is sufficient. Um, uh, they're not gonna have payroll records. So the bank is going to be looking at the profitability of that business. Now, if they're taking a loss, they're probably not gonna qualify for this program um, uh, on that schedule uh, C. So, or if they're looking at um, maybe on a quarterly basis, what they did in 2019 and compared to 2020, that's potentially a possibility. But again, um, the lender could come back and say, well, you know, we're looking at the schedule C and we're showing a loss in 2019 and, and we just don't see where we're, Type of funding. But for businesses that uh, do have employees, um, they're going to be looking for uh, quarterly reportings to the IRS, which is uh, 940s and 941s, which is showing where that employer has paid their portion of payroll tax, where they're reporting the amount of employees that they have. Um, they can provide W-2s that can also show uh, that they have employees and, and confirm the amount of full-time and part-time employees that they have. Um, if they're using a payroll service, they can get documentation from that payroll service. Uh, one of the questions that has come up is that um, some businesses, because they do use a payroll service, it actually goes underneath that company's EIN number. And so that's been a challenge. And so again, it's a matter of going back to that company to get the proof to show these are in fact the records from the business that is applying. And so if there's some documentation that can be provided, uh, then the bank is willing to look at that, but they can't just come with application in hand, no documentation say, I'd like to apply for this PPP loan because that's not gonna happen. Um, so, uh, and typically the lenders will also provide a document checklist of what they're looking for with their application um, as well. Um, there is a couple of other things that I think is relevant to point out with this PPP program, uh, with this new funding. 
And uh, if you don't mind, Kevin. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Right. The second draw and even the, the first one, if you've never applied before, the deadline is March 31st, 2021. So that's, that's important to know is that if you don't get your application in before then, then you're still not going to be able to take advantage um, of this program. It is first come first serve as far as funding, but there is a certain amount of money that's been set aside for minority businesses, for businesses that are in low uh, income uh, areas. So there has been a set aside for that, which is great because we did have a lot of businesses that missed out um, that were smaller businesses the first time around with this program. Um, so there has, that has been thought of and there's funds that have been um, uh, set aside for that, uh, that lenders are encouraged to make sure that they get out the door. Um, there is also uh, uh, with the, um, with phase two, with them asking for the second draw. So if they've already received one draw under the, pay pay, uh, the paycheck protection program, if they apply for a second draw, they do have to demonstrate at least a 25% reduction in gross receipts and comparable to quarters in 2019 and 2020. So they are having to provide proof for that where they did not necessarily need to provide the proof before um, with the, the uh, PPP um, uh, initial loan. So that is something that is new um, as well. Um, and if uh, it is a business that falls under the NICS codes um, 72, basically restaurants, or in, um, not restaurants, but 72 as far as uh, restaurants and other industries that fall underneath that, um, then they are actually able to get uh, three and a half times their average monthly income, uh, monthly payroll versus uh, other businesses that are only at two and a half of their payroll. So there's some other- That's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, there's some yeah. other things along with it as well. Okay. Okay. And I take it that would be like restaurants and bars under that category. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so listen, some amazing information that I think is going to be very, very helpful, but going back to then there's a question, I think is at least one question and some comments too, but uh, in regards to the 25% less, that could be in any quarter of last year, right? Compared sure. to the prior year? Comparing quarter to quarter, yeah. 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 Okay. That's the good thing, you get to pick the quarter, right? So yeah. uh, keeping in mind that some businesses are seasonal. So yeah. um, yes, as long as you're comparing the same quarters of the years, it's fine. Okay, got it, awesome. So there's a question here and I think you may have already answered it, but it says, my wife and I started our real estate development business in 2019 and we're co-owners with no payroll, but we have expenses. Do we qualify for the PPP loan? Yes, absolutely. Um, they, the two of them actually would be considered employees. Though they're not W-2 employees, they are employees of their company and they would qualify. The question then becomes is, was the business profitable? Did the business show a profit at the end of the year? And if so, then their Schedule C would be, is going to be what is used to help uh, determine what their monthly payroll costs would have been. Okay, got it. So, that's gonna make me dig in a little bit more. So let's say you show the profit, which you have to be able to show a profit, right? Um, and you outperformed last year. The big thing is whether or not, and by the way, when we ask quarters, is it just any three month period within that entire fiscal year? So let's just say it was March, April, May of 2020 versus March, April, May of 2019. As long as you show the 25% decline, and you were profitable in 2020, you would be able, you would be able to qualify. Well, that would be for uh, the second draw loans. So that's only for those. So if they received a PPP loan initially and they're wanting to get a second one, then that rule applies. If they've never received a PPP loan, then that rule does not apply. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Thank you for answering that. And then uh, the question from Scott earlier. Um, you answer. So thank you for that. Remember, y'all, those that are watching right now, you get the uh, opportunity to ask a question at this point in time while we have the experts on the line, which is critically important because some people are going to watch this tonight and tomorrow in this weekend. And guess what? They won't be able to ask on the spot. And we're going to tell them what they can do to still get their answers. 
But right now you have the opportunity. So if there's anything on your mind, drop it in the chat and we'll get that answer before we wrap up uh, this evening, okay? So with that being said, so let's actually talk about what are the next steps, right? So I'm a business owner. I just heard what you all just shared. And, um, and like, so what's the first thing that I should do? I know you mentioned, you know, your bank and we can reach out to you all, but like, what's the first step for the person who's listening to this? They've heard about it and like, I think I qualify with, based off of what they told me and now I need to do what? So what I, re what I recommend is, is that they go to the sba.gov website and they actually uh, uh, download and print off the Paycheck Protection Program application. And they complete that application because that will position them then to have all the information that they need when they speak to a banking officer. Um, and then the next step would be to actually reach out to their bank um, and if they and and see if they are offering the program because not all banks are right and if they're participating and if they are then that's great then you can set up an appointment or take the next steps that they're going to um, guide you to take in starting the application process. Um, it doesn't take long um, to get funding on this program it shouldn't be any uh, longer than 60 days if you provide all of the documentation necessary um, uh, when you apply. Uh, the bank cannot submit uh, the application for approval to the SBA until they have everything that they need. And so the delay would come not uh, from the banking partners from this point of view uh, at this time, as it was when it first rolled out. We had the banks that was struggling to get this out uh, to businesses and so forth. That's not the case now. They've got it down to a science. So if you get held up, it's going to be because you've not prepared, you've not gotten the documentation together that you need to to make the application. So first and, all, first and foremost is pull down the application, get it complete, make sure you have everything, speak to a banking officer, find out what else you need, set up an appointment if that's uh, uh, the next step and go in with your application and your documents that they're requiring so that you can get your information submitted. If your bank is not uh, participating in the Paycheck Protection Program, go to the lender match that is on the sba.gov uh, website and uh, put in your zip code and it will give you a list of the lenders that are participating in the Paycheck Protection Program and you can go to one of them. Exceptional. Now, is that lendermatch.com? Um, it's on the sba.gov website under the Paycheck Protection Program. Okay. And on there, you will see a, a button that says lender match and if they click that, it'll take them to the appropriate link. Okay. Yes. That, makes, that makes it that a, easy. Um, yeah, a direct link is uh, sba.gov forward slash paycheck protection. Forward slash find. Forward slash. Okay. Got it. All right, cool. So with that being said, those are your steps, right? Step one, two, and three for you to execute and for you to follow up to complete this process, all right? So now, where does, where does uh, Ohio SBDC come into play, right? So how do you all help at this point, right? There are people already know what they need to do, but let's just say that they're still like, what's next for me? Like, where do you all come into play? What's an ideal scenario for a business owner to reach out in this situation now that they know how to get this process started? I'll let you take that one out. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, I would encourage them uh, if, to go ahead and start the process, right? Yeah. So get that application start completing it. If they get stuck mm -hmm. completing the application, then is the time to reach out to us and say, hey, I'm having some problems navigating through the application so that we can help them uh, get that completed. Yeah. Um, and uh, so let's say they, they've got the application under control and now they're looking at the documents that they need and they're not sure that their documents is uh, the, what they should be presenting. Again, that's another time that they can reach out to the SBDC for us to review the documents to make sure that what they're presenting is what the bank is gonna be looking for and um, uh, so that we can make sure that, uh, that they can move along in the process. Uh, another stopping point for them may be calculating what their, their um, monthly payroll uh, expenses are. Again, they can reach out to us and we can help them with um, that calculation to make sure that that number that they're providing on their application is correct. So, um, we encourage them to do the work first, right? 
and to contact us um, as they need us, um, not the other way around. Don't come with blank papers in hand and say, hey, I need your help. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. There's just, there's too many small businesses that are in dire need and we need to be as effective as possible. And that is allowing the small business owner to do some of the work first and come to us as they need our, our assistance. Okay. So I want everybody to take that message, right? Do your part first, right? Take the accountability as the business owner, own your documents, your paperwork was required, take the necessary steps. And then once you're at a point where you still need help, that's when you reach out, right? So don't come with the blank paper or no paper at all, right? Y'all heard it. So a couple of times. All right. So uh, with that being said, so in order to get in contact with you all, right? So if they're going to reach out to SPDC, Ohio SPDC, how do they get in contact with you all? Forms of communication. They can always go to our website at sbdccolumbus.com. We have a contact us page on there. Um, you can also, you'll also find our primary number, which is 614-287-5294. Um, so they can just call in directly uh, via either of those two channels uh, will be uh, a direct link. You know, there are other, you know, sometimes people find us through our state site. Um, that one's a little bit more complicated for people to find. So um, there are other ways that people will find us, but typically it's going to be via that. Oh, and we also have an email address at um, sbdc at cscc.edu. But the oh, easiest yeah. one is to just go to the website and yeah. and do the contact us. Outstanding. And if you can't remember any of that, just go to columbusblack.com and there's a cool banner at the top and it'll take you directly to their website. All right. So that's an easy way as well. So with that being said, um, I want to go back. There's a there's a question in regards to the documents, right? So you mentioned the documents, right? And I know that there's different things, there's different options. What would the key documents uh, be that someone would need to have prepared? Um, and I know that could be bank statement, you mentioned Schedule C, but just to recap that part again. So um, depending on the type of business structure it is, there's yeah. certain documents that that business will have. So if it's a sole proprietor or an LLC, 100% owned by one individual, they're gonna be coming with a schedule, uh, uh, LLC, 100% owned by an individual, they'll come with a Schedule C. Okay. If it is a business that has uh, W-2 employees, um, they can provide their IRS quarterly uh, 940s, 941s, 944 payroll statement. Um, they can provide payroll reports showing salary, wages, um, paid time off vacation. Um, if they, uh, they can also show um, uh, W-2s, uh, for their employees as well. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is that um, any compensation over 100,000 is deducted from that. So if there's somebody who's making over 100,000, um, that 100,000 will be taken out of that, uh, that payroll expense. Um, documentation showing health insurance, documentation uh, of the sum of all retirement plans, payroll summary reports to confirm payroll cost and number of employees, as of February 15th, 2020, um, 1099s uh, for sole proprietors or independent contractors. And so that's not for uh, the business that hires 1099 contract workers. That is for the actual 1099 contract worker who's filing their own Schedule C. Um, they can provide their 1099 statement. And then um, documentation verifying their 25% decline in revenues um, from, from comparable quarters. So that could be a quarterly profit and loss statement. That could be three months worth of bank statements over those the, the quarter the, that you're going to use. Um, so all of those things, and I think they're, they're pretty flexible as far as what they're looking for, um, can be used in helping to um, verify whatever that figure is that you're putting on the application as your monthly um, uh, payroll and operating expenses. All right. All right. All right. Sounds good. A lot of great information, right? So um, as we get ready to wrap up, one of the things that I want to do is I want to leverage this time because of you all's expertise of working with business owners to help point uh, some business owners in the right direction, right? So this is kind of like our real talk. So we know that in 2020, one of the big challenges was paperwork and documentation, right? And that even came up earlier in this conversation. So as far as recommendations for business owners that may not have 
taken the time to identify a company or an individual to handle their paperwork and their processes. Um, based off what you all have seen, what are some of the recommendations or guidance that you will provide to help get those business owners on track? Um, a lot of this I'm going to def <laughs> defer to Ellen because uh, we are so so much financial. I told you I'm marketing. Um, but I know when we're talking to our clients, you know, I mean, definitely they should have some type of bookkeeping, right? You know, so QuickBooks is definitely, you know, industry standard. And like, there's all different types of levels that you can get with QuickBooks. I believe they have like a micro enterprise level that is like maybe less than $20 a month that they can get. They can do it online. There's also a web, uh, a program called WAVE, W-A-V-E. And I, the website to that one is a W-A-V-E app. I think it's, I can't remember if it's app or apps. But I think it's W-A-V-E-A-P-P-S.com. Um, and what it is, is that it is another um, uh, online based um, bookkeeping tool. And it is free for doing your bookkeeping, doing your invoicing. Uh, that is always free. And then if you utilize it to actually um, collect payments, you know, and, uh, you know, from the, those invoices, or if you use it for payroll, then there are associated fees with those. So if you really are really low budget, uh, wave is a good option, you know, and I believe it's going to have the same type of compatible download that you would need to download and then submit to your accountant. So, um, so that's definitely one thing is that you got to be able to, to make sure that um, you're keeping track of your records. Um, one of the things to keep in mind too, is that I think uh, like our, uh, an accountant, one of our accountants, um, Dave Krebs, that he is a, a local small business owner himself. And, um, He's a great supporter of small business owners here in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And one of the things that he always looks at is the company's vision, right? And so really think about what is your, where you want to go with your company. And that's really what you, what you want to think. I mean, because like what happens is that, you know, problem that we run into, not just with the, pay, the Paycheck Protection Program, but anytime a, a company is seeking funding, mm -hmm. is if they're writing everything off and they have no, you know, they're not showing any kind of profit on their taxes, then it doesn't show any value in the business, right? It doesn't show like when, when a bank says, give me your tax return, your tax returns. If there's no profit there, there's not going to be anything that they um, are going to be willing to lend for, you know, because it's not showing that they're, you're going to make the money to pay the, to pay the lender back. So you got to really think about it. I mean, if you're, you know, bootstrapping and, and your expenses of course are legit, you know, then, you know, absolutely go ahead and, and write those off. But just remember that if you, if you continue to show a loss in your business, it's going to hurt you in the long run, you know, either for getting um, funds or for selling the business one day. No one, of course, wants to buy a business that doesn't show any kind of value, right? Yeah. So, Ellen, do you have anything to add to that? Those were um, actually very, very great points. And I would say to, to, to the QuickBooks, um, I, I think it's one of the better tools that mm -hmm business can use. And there's one called um, QuickBooks Self-Employed that actually has a mileage app to it and so forth. And it's it's really handy and very um, user-friendly um, that I recommend to a lot of um, small businesses. Um, in addition to that, um, Tanya's dead on when she's talking about if you're writing off every expense to your business, you can see how it's impacting you now. If you're looking at these paycheck protection programs, you're not going to qualify. But beyond that, there's still other funding that's available and out there for small businesses outside of this Paycheck Protection Program and um, regular SBA 7A, SBA 504 programs, regular um, uh, business conventional loans the bank offers. But again, you have to show some type of profitability with that business to show that you have enough uh, revenue coming in um, to be able to, to take on any type of more debt. And so, um, I think that's a crucial piece that she point out there that is that uh, you don't want to write off everything to the point where um, your business has no value to it. So yeah, that's some great points there. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And just uh, the one thing about uh, that Ellen made me um, re recall about QuickBooks, the other nice thing about uh, like the, some of the, the QuickBooks program is that there are a lot of associated um, apps for your phone that you can get, you know, that can help you track your time and that can also help track mileage and they all integrate in with the, um, with QuickBooks. So that's another thing too. You can use that, you know, to, you know, to track your, I think it's called time sheets, you know, that can actually monitor time and everything. So um, the QuickBook has lots of great integration tools that would really simplify. Outstanding, outstanding. Yes, Ellen. And here's the thing though, is it, is you think about your business and we think about the costs that are involved with running and operating a business, um, bookkeeping, mm -hmm. 
filing our taxes has to be a priority. It has to be one of those costs that are just automatically a part of the day-to-day -day operations of that business as is buying inventory or supplies. It's not an afterthought. It is a part of the everyday uh, process of running that business. And it should be one of the first things that is, that is given consideration is making sure that your books are handled, that they're up to date, that they're current, that the taxes are paid. And if they're not paid, that they're on some type of payment plan because um, the, the last thing you want is Uncle Sam knocking on your door, right? And asking to see your records and you're pulling pieces of paper out of boxes and envelopes and so forth. So you want to make sure that um, you are taking care of the back office just as much as you are uh, uh, taking care of the front end and showing a, a good face for your business. You want to make sure your records are also represented well. Outstanding. All right, good stuff. Remember the goal is to run a profitable business profitable. not to run a business run a profitable business all right um so with that being said y'all have y'all have y'all brought it home i think right and i don't have any other questions uh in the chat at this point in time so uh before we wrap up one of the things that we always do is you know on these shows you guys you know you get to date you get the time and then you start preparing and then at some point you forget to say something that you meant to say and then we're done and the show is over and you're like i can't believe i didn't say that so Right now, you have the opportunity, if there's one thing that's on your mind that you will be remiss of if you didn't share, whether it's around a recommendation, a thought, anything, personal perspective, business perspective for those that are either entrepreneurs, those that are thinking about taking that leap in 2021 with all the changes that have happened um, in society, what is it that you may want to share before we actually wrap up today? Well, myself, I'll jump in there and, you know, as I said, at the heart, I'm a marketer, right? So that's what I do. <laughs> and so one of the things I want to make sure everyone listening knows is that, you know, we are, you know, a grant funded organization, like our success uh, doesn't happen unless our small businesses uh, achieve success themselves, right? And so we are here to be those free advisors, you know, um, that because it is paid by tax dollars, right? So you've already paid for it. So just come on in and let us assist you. And, um, and we will guide you, you know, if, if we are not um, able to um, get you what you need, you know, during the advising, then we, we connect you to resources. And one of the things that we do, especially in this realm of looking at these uh, capital funding, right, because there are going to be some people who are coming in, like these funds are not for startups, right? Mm -hmm. So these are for existing business owners who have payroll. You know, I mean, there are some, you know, that where, you know, uh, I know with the EIDL, you were able to start. So I saw Ellen, Ellen give me the look. There are some, some if you're within a certain, uh, so many months of starting that may, you may qualify, but it's not like to start a business. It's not for business development. It's for, it's, you know, to help you recover from COVID, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so if someone is in need of uh, funding and resources, you know, we look at every person individually, look at what type of business they have, what their situation is. And then uh, we look and are able to connect them to the best possible resource, right? And, uh, and so, and then we assist in that process. And, and, you know, we are with them side by side. You know, we don't just, you know, send you off and say, hey, you know, here's, here's someone over here, go find someone to, to fund. You know, we will pick up the phone. We have personal relationships with a lot of the bankers and uh, a lot of the different institutions. So, you know, we, uh, we provide that assistance along the way. So just, uh, just uh, you know, to know like um, beyond the COVID, you know, we are still here. We do find a lot, um, help, can help with other resources. Ellen is our, ca our Kiva Capital Access Manager. So we do have um, a Kiva based program. Uh, we are the hub for that here in Central Ohio. So um, just to make sure that, you know, that those other resources are available to you through us as well. Outstanding. And I would just add, Kevin, that um, there are still other uh, loan programs that are available out there for small businesses to take advantage of. Um, and the SBA Idle Economic Injury Disaster mm -hmm. Loan is one of them. They can still apply uh, for that funding as well. Um, in addition to that, um, they also rolled out a targeted uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Advance, and that is for businesses that um, signed. Uh, their application uh, for an idle loan prior to uh, December 27, 2020, they now will be given an opportunity to actually get uh, the advance that they um, uh, may not have been able to receive because funds uh, were exhausted. Mm -hmm. uh, the SBA is now going back, looking at those applications, 
to see how they can make those businesses whole and providing them an advance and even maybe more than what they initially got as far as an advance up to that $10,000. And so I encourage businesses to keep a lookout um, in their emails to see if the SBA has reached out to them um, about that program. And they're specifically looking for businesses that are located in uh, low income communities that have demonstrated that they had a 30% reduction in revenue. And so they wanna make sure that they're still getting them some funding, funding that is not a loan. So I think that's something that um, uh, uh, businesses should be aware of and, and make sure that they're paying attention uh, to. And then lastly, I have a professor at the college that I, that I deal with and he had made a, a statement, his motto is, is that either modify the dream or magnify the hustle. And I was like, oh, that's good, that's real good. And I would say right now for businesses that are going through this COVID mm -hmm. and uh, that are existing businesses and those that are thinking about starting a business, I would just tweak that model and say, either modify the dream and magnify the hustle is what we need to do. So as we have these businesses that are pivoting and trying to do something new and figuring out what can I do to still make money, but stay within what I know, that's, that's what they need to do. They need, to, they need to figure that out. They need to figure it out. Whether it's a restaurant that was open for sit down that that's now doing carry out um, to a, a young lady that was a stylist that's now coming to your hair, it's doing remote, whatever it is, you've got it, you've got to figure it out because now's the time for that. But in addition to that, you're going to work harder than you ever did before because you have to, right, to survive. And so as entrepreneurs, you have that spirit and tenacity to do so. And so we're here to support you as the SBDC. You're not in this alone. Um, but at the same point in time, you do need to modify the dream and uh, magnify the hustle. Y'all heard it. And then Tanya saw me doing this, and I think she started yeah. laughing. I know That's what it is. <laughs> I do that when those gems are being dropped. So she was dropping some gems, and I'm going like this, because guess what? Y'all know what y'all need to do, right? So modify the dream and magnify the hustle, right? So that's what we're going to do, and we're going to make it happen. Y'all have dropped so much information and knowledge for our guests. And once again, people are on right now, but a lot of people are going to watch this over the next 24, 36, 48 hours, and, um, and hopefully everybody is set up for success and knows exactly what to do because you all just shared a ton of knowledge and wisdom for all business owners. So thank you all so much. I really, really appreciate you all being on the show. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, once again, make sure you all check us out at info at columbusblack.com. If you're looking, as Tanya said, to market your business and advertise and promote what it is you do, that's what we're here for, right? So you can do it through our website, email blast, text blast, social media channels as well and obviously virtual events just like this. And we'll be happy to help you to promote and showcase your business. We do this show every Thursday, right? So every Thursday evening, we want to showcase and highlight Black-owned businesses to help, to help make sure they get the support that is needed. No excuses. And it's a free show. So if you have a business and you want that exposure, all you have to do is reach out to us and send an email to info at columbusblack.com and we'll get you on the schedule, all right? So with that being said, make sure you reach out to us. As I always wrap up, one of the things that I share with people all the time is in order to be more successful in your future, you need to understand a little bit more about your past. That's the reason why I just had Tanya and Ellen on the show with me, and I think we had a blast. And with that being said, y'all, it's about that time. I want to thank the Ohio Small Business Development Centers at Columbus State Community College for your support and being a sponsor of this event. And we appreciate all that you all are doing in the community to help small and uh, small businesses. All right. So with that being said, thank you all. And as normal. I'm out. Y'all have a good one. Bye-bye.